Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listener. This is Brad. I'm the producer of the Online Great Books Podcast. And this week and next on the show, Scott and Carl will be discussing... The practical and very entertaining book, Ten Acres Enough, the classic 1864 guide to independent farming. I'm just going to read you the description so you know what you're getting into. When author Edmund Morris left the Philadelphia business world in the early 1800s and bought a small farm in the New Jersey countryside, he was so pleased with the results of his venture that he decided to tell others how he accomplished it. His simply written chronicle, one of the most popular books of its time, emphasizes that agricultural success depends not on how much you grow, but on what and how. Between thoughtful discussions of choosing the location, selecting crops, and planting an orchard, he contrasts city and country life, despairs over weeds, that's a big part of the conversation today, and raising pigs, counts his gains and losses at the end of the first year, and writes warmly about the joys of establishing a home. Easy to comprehend and intended for anyone who wants to get away from it all. Have you ever met such a person? This delightfully written book will captivate Americana enthusiasts, would-be owners of small farms, and anyone drawn to the idea of an agrarian lifestyle. Both Scott and Carl have personal practical experience to contribute to the discussion. Make sure you check back next week for part two. Thank you for listening, and we begin. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to talk about Edmund Morris's 1864 book, Ten Acres Enough. On an earlier show, I listened to all of our shows, Carl, because I'm a big fan. I love what I love your work. Big fan. So I listen. <laughs> well, thank you. And I found that I had made a mistake. I said that this book was by, I don't know, somebody else, James Miller. The publishing company was called James Miller, and I opened up the deal you know, on the front matter. I saw that and said it on the fly there. But it's, no, it's not. It's Edmund, E-D-M-U-N-D, Morris. Did you like it? Yeah, I did. It's a back-to-the-land book for 1864. Uh, I think we should read the entire title. Yeah. Ten Acres Enough, a practical experience showing how a very small farm may be made to keep a very large family with... Extensive and profitable experience in the cultivation of the smaller fruits. Eighth edition, New York, published by James Miller. I like those kind of titles. Yeah, a very small farm may be made to keep a very large family. So who was he? A dude. He calls himself a mechanic. And as best I can tell, a mechanic in the 1850s, which was when he was a mechanic, by 1864 when he wrote this. I think they'd already been on their farm for about 10 years. In the 1850s when he wrote this, a mechanic would do a little hydraulic work, might do a little work on your steam engine, might do a little work on the bearings and pulleys and things in your factory. There aren't any automobiles, so this guy is working on different kinds of machines. He'd pour new Babbitt bearings or... Um, you know, and do, do repair work and maybe even a little bit of light manufacturing or make or manufacture some machine parts. So he was a mechanic in Philadelphia and had his own business. So he had a bunch of equipment, tools, so on, had rents there for his mechanics business. I think at that time he had six kids. You know, the business cycle was beating him up. He was in a capital intensive business where he's by, having to go borrow money to go buy a, a new hydraulic press. Can you imagine buying hydraulic equipment in the 1850s? It'd be like buying space shuttles or something. Well, space shuttles are 40 year old technology. What's new technology? Oh, wait, there isn't any new technology. There's no new technology. No, I don't, I don't know. But you can, if there was new technology, it would be like that. Wait, I can hear, I can hear our dear list, some of our dear listeners saying, what do you mean there's no new te technology? Right. I got a new, I got the iPhone 13. Computers have been around is, for a long, long time. And the fact that yeah. they're small and they fit in your pocket. It's not new. It's not new. You, you could argue it's an improvement, it's in, I, you know, maybe. Hmm? An iteration of old tech. Uh, I, I can't think of what the, the new thing, the last new thing would be. 
Yeah, somebody's saying electric cars. No, I mean, we had battery-operated flashlights. and but electric uh, cars in 1920. The, the first cars were electric, for crying out loud. So older than that, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't even know. You know, I, I wrote a blog post at scotthembert.com. I think the title of it is, It's All Been BS Since Antibiotics, that we really haven't had <laughs> a new helpful technology since the antibiotic. This show wasn't supposed to be about that, but I stand by that. <laughs> yeah, I read that one. Yeah, so this guy's in a high-tech industry. It was very expensive, and so so the vicissitudes of the business world would put him in in, in risk of financial embarrassment. He he says in here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's he's having to borrow money to operate his business from time to time, and in trying to pr put food on the table for his kids and keep the business afloat, he never was able to buy a home in Philadelphia. I think his rent was twelve hundred a year. I think is what he says. That's an astronomical amount of money. I mean, you think about two hundred dollars a month. Yeah. That's a lot of money. And, and so he resolved. Uh, chapter three: resolved to go, escape from business, and choosing a location. There you go. He resolved to go and escape from that business. Yeah, and find it. I want to read a bit from the the preface. Do it, Paige. You have a physical copy. I do. I think they're the same. It's just oh. a print up of yours. I think. Yeah, I don't have page numbers, so mm. I don't know. I'm gonna. It's like the third paragraph. Uh, I write more particularly for those who have not been brought up as farmers, for that numerous body of patient toilers in city, town, and village who, like myself, have struggled on from year to year, <laughs> anxious to break away from the bondage of the desk, the counter, or the workshop, to realize in the country even a moderate income, so that it be a sure one. He's making a choice to go to the farmland where he thinks he figures he figures he'll be poorer. Maybe, except his strawberries, you know, they worked out pretty well. That he'll be poorer, but that he's always going to have a crop of some sort. I mean, what were the 1850s like? Weren't there monetary crashes? There was banking trouble, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they yeah, they didn't listen to our trouble. greatest president, Andrew Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was banking trouble, and there has been ever since. He wants to get a, sh a, sh a more secure income, even if it be smaller. Yep. And thinks that the land is going to work for, for him. So I think he ends up in New Jersey. The Garden State. Yeah, I've driven through New Jersey. I've driven through the parts he's talking about, the sandy parts, mm -hmm. that I think uh, you would not in 1850 have thought this is prime farmland. Yeah, but he says in that sandy part, the watermelon's verily from the ground. <laughs> the guy is such a great writer, I think. I mean, this reads a lot yeah. like Thoreau to me. I'm not, he ain't Thoreau, but it reads a lot like that. I want to hit something you said earlier before we move on. You said this is a back to the land book. Yes. And our friend Kleinfelter at Online Great Books, he says, you know, and I, I've heard other people say this. You know that every 20 years or so, there's this sort of back to the land movement, and we're back in that again. But has it ever stopped? Isn't there, I don't know, since the Industrial Revolution, isn't there always like a disaffected group of people that want to cut out all the intermediaries? This is how I see the back to the land thing. People go to work and sit in their cubicle or at the workshop or at the desk or whatever it is he says. Let me, well, I'll just say, I'll read what he says again. You, you read it. Uh, uh, there are people that break away from the bondage of the desk, the counter, or the workshop. Like, don't we go to the desk, the counter, or the workshop to make a few shekels so that we can have food and shelter? Right? So you go do, you, yes. you go do one thing so you can have those things. But if you cut out all the middlemen and your job was to create food and shelter <laughs> and you somehow got paid for something for it, so you've got a farm, your stock in trade, your actual capital is really your home place so that when you improve your business, you are improving your home and you get to eat your own supply like a wholesome drug dealer and you cut out the intermediary. At that point, any <laughs> cash that you generate is bo the bonus round. You cut out the intermediary. Yeah, well, you think... This is where Aristotle can help. You think uh, teleologically, 
you think, what is the final good that I'm aiming at? So we have instrumental goods and goods that are good in themselves. This is all in book one of Nick and McCain Ethics, which you would read with us if you joined Online Great Books, which you can do at onlinegreatbooks.com. Uh, sign up for the mailing list. You want to figure out what is the ultimate goal. Why am I working? Am I working my cubicle job because I just love cubicles? I doubt it. You probably, and the proof of that is, do you go on vacation in your cubicle? No, you go on vacation somewhere else. A, a decent vacation can give you a little clarity on what it is you're actually looking for. You're probably going to go places where there are fewer people or that are closer to nature. We like to go to oceans. Maybe some people would vacation in New York City. I, people I, do that. People go to Disneyland. Uh, but, but even then, it's an escape. They're seeking something entirely different and opposed to their regular situation. Now, there is probably somebody here that is, is you know, still drinking the Kool-Aid. It's like, well, I always work when I'm on vacation. I enjoy my work. And, uh, well, you're just not there yet. You're just not there yet. It's okay, brother. You will, you, my dad says, when we were talking about how, what I should do for a living, he said, listen, uh, try to not get dirty and get paid because you'll hate it all in 10 years anyway. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, people ask me about uh <laughs> people would ask me about PhDs cuz I got one. Why? I don't know. I got one. Should I get one? And I say, "Well, do you really love how much do you love your 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 subject matter? You better love it more than anything cuz you're going to hate it. <laughs> and if you don't already really love it, right. you'll never get through and you might as well not start." I remember uh we used to uh you know, before you got tied to the land, we used to we did uh shoot Hamburg Alusa a couple of times in various locations. And, uh, it was all right. The kids were somewhat close to the same age. It was all right. It was fun. And we did that one in Missouri yeah, yeah. where we rented a farmhouse and you drove out. It was by Cuba, Missouri. There was nothing to do. There's nothing to do except play wizard and, and make yeah. biscuits and enjoy each other's company. It, but you know, there you are out on the land and I think, uh, why can't I do this all the time? Well, maybe you can't. It's hard to get land these days. But, but maybe if you make a few different decisions, and maybe you can. Mm -hmm. So in chapter one, he says, uh, <laughs> well, I like his thrift, his description of his thrift. Having saved a few hundred dollars by dint of close application to business and avoiding taverns, oyster houses, theaters, <laughs> and fashionable tailors, I married and went into business <laughs> the same year. Oyster houses and fashionable tailors. Apparently a, a big suck on your, your money in Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to this, though. Uh, I, I mean, I've done large, small business. This stuff's still true. These two contemporaneous drafts upon my capital, proving heavier than I expected, they soon used it up, leaving me thereafter greatly straightened for means. It is true my business kept me, but as it was constantly expanding, it was such a nature that a large proportion of my annual gain was necessarily invested in tools, fixture, and machinery. I was nearly always short of ca ready cash to carry on my operations with comfort. At certain times, also, it ceased to be profitable. The crisis of 1837 nearly ruined me as I was kept struggling along during the five succeeding years of hard times until the revival of 1842 came around. Previous to this crisis, necessity had driven me to the banks for discounts, one of the sore evils of doing business upon insufficient capital. Uh, and he just goes on to talk about, you know, things would heat up. He would make he would make money. He would expand the business as a result of that. And then there would be a recession. He would have to go um, draw on lines of credit to make it through the recession. And it was just in this constant Philadelphia two-step trying to have a family and a life. You know, nothing's changed. Hell, I'll be political. You know, the modern monetary theorists think that they can get rid of the business cycle. And the business cycle, we haven't gotten rid of it. it that shouldn't. shouldn't be political. That's true. That is their claim. Now, here's where it gets political. They're wrong. <laughs> we haven't been able to get rid of that. Uh, and this guy, you know, starting with 1837 is in that and getting, getting rough handled because of it. And so uh, again, back to, you know, Mr. Kleinfelter talking about, you know, these back to the land movements and how they come in cycles. They certainly do seem to come in cycles, but it never really goes away. 
the sort of disenfranchising work and the disaffectation or whatever that people have from, you know, post uh, industrial revolution, there's just always a large number of people that want to provide for themselves in a less abstract way rather than go work for this guy doing that thing. So you can then go to the store and buy a strawberry. There has always been a large number of people that sure would like to just work growing the strawberry. Sounds good. Right. It sounds good. It sounds impossible. It sounds impossible. How could I, what could I do? You know, um, if you are a city slicker, like I am a suburb slicker, like I am, boy, is it scary to put seeds in the ground? You know, it's the, the biblical image, you have to die, like the seed dies. And then it's like a resurrection when it comes up. That's what it feels like when you plant your turnips or your radishes or whatever. And especially if you're planting them to feed your family, that you're going to depend on them. It seems like black magic. And so one of the uses of this book is it's, I mean, this is 1864, 1850s technology and understanding of the dirt. And he takes 10 acres and he cultivates the hell out of it. And it tells you how he does it in, well, in New Jersey and, uh, manages to grow a lot of food. It's, it's, it's astounding. So I want to talk, uh, this is just, this is still in chapter one. I want to talk about his wife. I do too. That's right. <laughs> I've got here, right here. Yeah. <laughs> that he loves her so much, and he, he says uh, wonderful things about it. Did we ever get her first name? I don't think so. We know the oldest daughter's name, and I think that's the only other person. It's Kate. I think that's it. Yeah, he's pretty reserved about putting his family in print. It's yeah. like Instagram people, which I got banned from, putting their families in Instagram. <laughs> so uh, he talks about uh, he couldn't have done this without his wife. I discovered my wife to be a jewel of priceless value, coming up heroically to the task and relieving me of a world of care. This is even before they moved, but I just want to mention his vision of of the good life. I think it's it's really interesting. Uh, he c- says that what she is good at it was the art of calculation joined to the habit of order and the power of proportioning our wishes to the means of gratifying them. Fantastic yeah. calculation and order. What do you need for a happy home life? Apparently, Mrs. Morris knows what that is. Yeah, and women who have been well-educated, this is Morris talking, far from despising domestic duties will hold them in high respect because they will see that the whole happiness of life is made up of the happiness of each particular day and hour and that much of the enjoyment of these must depend upon the punctual practice of virtues which are more valuable than splendid. I had that highlighted. I love that bit about, and people are going to harumph, you know. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we underline the same things. That's how we know we should be doing this show together. That bit, people are going to harump about women's roles or whatever. I don't care about that. I think all of that stuff is ridiculous. The point is a good home life, isn't it? Seems like it. Isn't that what we want? And what is a good home life? A good home life is not, I don't know what even people think it is. Coming home tired choking down a sandwich, throwing the kid in the car, racing to soccer practice, coming home from soccer practice, fighting with the kid to do their stupid worksheets, getting the kid in bed at 10.15, watching a snarky late night show for 42 minutes, and then blacking out and repeating it. How about Hmm. that? (laughs) How about, and I don't do this very well. I, I wish to do it better. How about, uh, well, it'd be nice if you spend most of your day at your home. Maybe you're out hoeing a row in your in your uh, little cultivated acres. And then how about you make a nice meal? A meal that is, when we did the Maritan show, how about a meal that is an art? Artfully done. Mm. Craftsmanship. Yeah. That is going to be a pleasure... I mean, what better pleasures are there than eating and drinking and talking? Well, for the purpose of this show, none. <laughs> uh, well, she, he does say his, his family yes, was multiplying yes. around him. So apparently they had that too. 
I like it. That it was just kind of happening. <laughs> But, you know, what are the best moments, if you think about what are the best moments of your life? Are they really that choking down the sandwich and, and sacking out to Jimmy Kimmel? Come on. Let's do some values clarification. What are the best moments? Then, what does it take for you to get more of them? And I, I think most of us, if you are sensible, you're probably going to say, well, gosh, I really liked that day when I was playing cards and my whole family was around and, and we were having a good time. That was good. Well, how can we do more of that? Well, he and his wife determined that we had no longing for excessive wealth, a mere competency, though, earned by daily toil, so that it was reasonably sure and free from the drag of continued indebtedness to others was all we coveted. Yeah. I was a little worried when I first read this. I was a little worried that he was just a terrible business person. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's able to feed everybody and the family continues to multiply, but he's never able to buy a house. And I'm like, golly, you know, you're in a cutting edge technology in one of the largest cities in the world in uh, 1851. Can we, can we not make a go of it? You know, well, you read the rest of the book and the guy's a good businessman. I mean, there's, there is no question about it. So I believe him. I believe him about how difficult business was. Um, we have this idea that really kind of started with, it started really with Adam Smith. And then by time, uh, this is 70 to 80 years after Smith's book, Wealth of Nations, that we have this creative destruction thing in uh, Smithville, where we're all influenced by Adam Smith and then his philosophical offspring. We're told this creative destruction creates value and is good. Well, maybe it does if you do whatever kind of utilitarian math that you do to come up with that answer. But what about if you're the guy that gets his ass crushed all the time with this, all this good old creative destruction? What about you? What if you're the guy that hawked everything he had to buy the cutting edge manufacturing machine? 20 years later, a young person who's a lot like you hawks everything he has and his future and buys the newer machine. You just got yours paid off. You've busted your ass. Your wife has pinched the face off of every fucking penny that you had. The kids are handing down clothes. By the time the littlest kid, who's the eighth kid, gets the shoes, there's almost nothing left. And now this young person, who we have compassion for and you know, and don't begrudge anything, comes in and buys the newer machine just as you get yours paid off. Well, you just need to go learn to code. Right. Now, what about this? What if that young person is on a different continent? Uh Uh-oh. 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 Oh, comparative advantage. We'll do a show about Ricardo and how dumb he is about free trade. We'll do that one day. But 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 he's he's in a hot he is in this he's in the tech world. He's having a hard time funding um uh, his technical adva- his technical advancement inside his company. I love in chapter 2 the way he talks about money and the way he talks about interest. If you ever go read uh Ben Franklin's autobiography, he talks about interest and money and borrowing in much the same way. Uh, uh the second paragraph of chapter 2 he says Looking at the matter of removal to the country in a practical lie, I found that in the city I was paying $300 per annum. I said it was $1,200. I'm sorry. $300 per annum rent for a dwelling house. It was the interest of $5,000, yet it afforded nothing but a shelter for my family. Isn't that interesting? That instead of saying, oh, I'm paying $300 a year, 25 bucks a month, He's like, I'm spending the income from $5,000 of passive investment to have almost nothing. Mm -hmm. That's actually the way I look at it. Charity and I've talked about this. She's like, "Uh, let's go on this vacation. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. If we go do that and I spend all that money, that's going to cost us $400 a year forever. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, he, he sees the opportunity cost yeah. in a clearer way than most people do. 
I love that. Well, on the other hand, I I don't know, I don't know Philadelphia in 1850. I I don't think I would want to own property in a city right now. I think if I had to live in a city, I I might just want to rent so that I could leave. Maybe. Maybe. You know, he said he really wants to own land. He wants to own the home in a place that he doesn't want to ever leave. <laughs> this book isn't about him and his wife finding a way to buy a house in Philadelphia. That's not what they did. So he he does he he ultimately yeah. doesn't want to either. He wants to leave. And by the way, this is on the eve of the Civil War. And there's a little bit of talk in here about, you know, how people want to get out when times get tough. Uh, and he says, the preference for re- investment in real estate will doubtless be objected to by the young and dashing businessman. But lands or a fund secured by real estate is unquestionably not only the highest security, but in the hands of heirs, it is the only one likely to survive a se- single generation. So he's interested in land for a number of reasons. Land is more expensive now than it was then. Duh. But he's still interested in buying land. He didn't go west. I think that's interesting. No, he could have got it cheap. Hell, he could have got it free if he walked far enough. Land was inflationary <laughs> in North America in 1858. They were still printing more of it, sort of, kind of. You could, If you walked far enough, you could get some more. <laughs> he chose to go closer to the seaboard and actually pay more. It's interesting. He doesn't actually ever, he doesn't even talk about that. He doesn't even talk about he and his wife ever consider, you know, pioneering or homesteading or, or, or whatever. Well, he does. He talks about the... This might be good for right. foreigners. Yeah, that's true. He does say that. You know? But he has family around him. I'm thinking, uh, this is a book, maybe someday we'll read it, Willa Cather's My Antonia, which is about, uh, uh, I think she's a Czech girl, but there's Czechs and Russians out there and yeah. wherever it is, Nebraska. You're already across the ocean. You don't have any family. Go for it. He has people in Philadelphia that will come out and visit him. Yeah. And spend weekends at his farm. The European passion for acquiring land is strangely contrasted with the American passion for parting with it. I, I don't understand that. You know, our, our friend Darren Deaton, Carl, you know, he says there are two kinds of land. Have you heard him say this? There are two kinds of land. Land mm-hmm. you've got, land you want. <laughs> How many acres does he have? I don't know. He's pro- he's, he's around a couple hundred. Yeah, but that's like ten. That's like ten acres in a fertile area. He's like, "How many you got, Hamburg?" I said, fifty-five. He's like, "Well, you know." I said, "But we catch more rain on my fifty-five than you do your 200. He's like, "Well, that's that's probably true. <laughs> that's probably true." <laughs> you have to have big ranches in Texas because no there's no there's no water. Yeah, his well is literally four times deeper than mine. Uh, I like this line. This is somewhere in, in to. Chapter two. Indeed, until one tries it for himself, there it is incredible what dignity there is in an old hat, what virtue in a time-worn coat, and how savory the dinner table can be made without sirloin steaks or cranberry tarts. Yeah. There's a lot of talk about thrift here. And I was thinking about my old hat. I have a terrible hat. It's true. (laughs) You've seen it. It's terrible. It's this Carhartt thing. It's shapeless. Uh, all it does is keep the sun off my head. And I've thought about getting a new hat, which would be hard because I'm a seven and seven eights. No, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna keep my battered hat for a while. Like there's a there's a scene in Lob O M, which is the opera most people start with, where the guy sings a song to his old coat that has carried him through. It's this poor guy and all he's got is the coat. I think that's good. You should strive to have old clothing. I if think. any of you out there are tent or awning makers, maybe you could make Carl a new hat. <laughs> <laughs> I think my head is growing. I uh, Andrew Andrew uh, had a picture. He said, I, I was a judge at a uh, strength lifting meet last weekend. And so Andrew Jackson took a picture of me. Maybe I can send it to you. And my wife saw it and she's like, your head got, how is your head so big? Heads don't grow, do yeah, they? I think they do. Ears do. Noses do. I don't know. Uh, so, I don't know. Chapter three, they're starting to figure out where do they want to be? That's the question. If you decide you want to get out, okay, now. Now what? And he says, um, he says, the proper choice of location was not going to be the great question. 
I had determined on giving my attention to the raising of smaller fruits for great market, the great markets of New York and Philadelphia. And he, he wanted to be next to the railroads, and he wanted to have ready access to these two big markets. And Joel Salatin, who's sort of the market garden, you know, small farm guru of North America, or maybe the world, and he says you've got to be within 40 acres of a big metro, or 40 out, uh, miles of a big metropolitan center so that you can market your, your stuff directly. You don't want to be selling to the co-op, and you don't want to be selling it wholesale. You want to be able to market directly. I mean, you end up selling to a wholesaler. He tell, talks here about selling to fruit brokers, but he's not having to sell to the farmer's co-op who then puts it on a barge and then sends it to, you know, China or something. Yeah, which might be, this might be different if you're not, the market, so a market garden, this is a term that is coming up. You are growing things that you are going to sell and that's going to be your income. Yeah, it's not a garden for your own use. It's for taking to market. Yeah. Yeah. So you need a good market. And and that's the thing about New Jersey is uh, uh, I, I've driven all up and down it. I mean, it's Philadelphia on one end and New York on the other, and it's not that big. So it is well suited for, for this sort of thing. Did they call it the Garden State before? I don't I know. wonder what time that name came in. I don't know. Uh, but he settles on it. He says, land was far cheaper. Okay. Here you go. There was no state debt. Hmm. Taxes were merely nominal. In an acre that could be bought for $30 could be made four times as productive as an acre of the best wheat land in Pennsylvania. Well, okay, the land's cheap. It could be more productive than other farmland that was in, uh, you know, near to a big market, as far as he could tell. What about the state debt and taxes being nominal? Hmm. Yeah, tell me about it. Uh, this man, this man hates tax, or he hates debt. It had it had put him in almost penury. He says he says on page eleven, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five paragraphs in. I had worked for the landlord long enough, and he had also worked for the bank long enough. He talks about, and he knows that the state, if it's in debt, is working for the the bank. So that means when your state's in debt, you, being the income generating portion of the state, is working for it. He's not interested in it. Yeah. I found something interesting here. So Edmund Morris loves manure. <laughs> he do. Yeah. Talks about it all the time. And, and I had never heard of this before, and I don't know if anybody's even written any history of it, but he says uh, somewhere around there, of his location, it was also of easy access from the city for manure boats. Yep. What's a manure boat? I never knew there were such things. I didn't either, but it makes perfect sense. If everything's, you know, horse drawn and you've got a big city like New York or... Uh, yeah, what do they do with all this shite? It's got to go somewhere. We know there were street sweepers. So some enterprising young lad had said, huh, I bet this is good for farms. And then got a, a a boat and then hired some people to shovel shit all day into a boat and then you'd cart it down the coast to the farmers perfect but then when the automobile came along it probably killed the manure boat yeah and and not only killed the manure boat but just decreased the amount of manure available that's one of the things i was thinking about and so you know at that point you're you're just you're forced kind of to use nitrogen fertilizer, mm -hmm. chemical fertilizer. Yeah, I was thinking about that. A certain state has outlawed small motors, which would be interesting, like lawnmowers and leaf blowers and and Which state and was chainsaw. that? Chainsaw. Some state. Are you being coy or do you not remember? In some country that's... I do remember. But if I'm too specific, right. then it gets political. But I was thinking, well, what the heck... What, what the... It's California. What the heck are you going to do to tend your acres if you had any in California? Scythe. Well, what it made me think was, well, could I get a mule? Could I get a horse? Are there any of those old cultivators still around that you hitch to the back of the horse? Or could we make them again? Sure. And then your horse eats your grass and you, you give it grass and water. Uh, you know, how, many, how much acres do you need to, to support a beast of burden like that? 
But then what you get from it is horse shit. <laughs> yeah. Which is not the good stuff. You know, I went to the, uh, to the Greg Judy grazing school, you know, and where well, and he, and he does high density grazing. So he'll put 400 head of cattle on two acres for eight hours. You can't not step and poop. You can't do it. And uh, he just loves it. He loves it as much as Edmund Morris does. He's like, you see that? That's a dollar bill. You see that? That's a dollar bill. He's pointing at him. That's a dollar bill. <laughs> and uh, he'll get down there and break them open with his, you know, bust it open with his hand. I mean, he he loves it. And, and I get it. I get it. I do too. Yeah. So the plants need, we should, for, the plants need nitrogen to grow. Most of them. Corn especially needs lots of nitrogen. Uh, it's a nitrogen hog. How do you get that in the dirt? Well, you have some options. If you have ruminant critters, they will eat the grass. They will breathe in. I guess you breathe it in from the air. And then it comes out in the urine and in the, the poop. Yeah, there's protein, you know, the clovers, you know, 12 points or something like that. It's it's in there. But they, uh, they the, the animals end up fixing nitrogen for you. Yeah. Uh, which then in turn grows plants. And if you don't have that, how do you get the nitrogen in the soil? So, so let's say, let's say, for example, I were to be a vegan and decide that we don't want to raise any more cattle. I think that's bad. Okay. Your hat would be smaller. My hat would be smaller. <laughs> how do I get the nitrogen in the soil to grow the corn, which provides probably the bulk of the calories in the United States? How do I do it? Burn a bunch of natural gas. Hopper process. So I, I dig down into the ground and I get hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and then I turn that into nitrogen-based fertilizer. And so you're putting oil on your field, essentially, to help the planet because having cattle would hurt the planet. Yeah, it's crazy. The cattle mm. fix nitrogen. Then you grow more plants, which use CO2 as a food. They make plant matter out of it. It sequesters the CO2 back into the soil, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. People are nuts. Uh, this guy sold his business. Yeah, I'd rather have manure boats. Make manure boats great again. <laughs> he So this guy, he sells his business. Page 13, he says, I little knew what the future was to bring forth and how soon my want of thankfulness was to be changed into the profoundest conviction that I had providentially escaped from total ruin and come out comparatively rich. I had made myself snug upon my little farm when the tornado of 1857 toppled my former establishment into utter ruin. My successor was made a bankrupt and his business was destroyed, leaving him overwhelmed with debt. He had lost all while I, I had saved all. Had I not sold when I did and secured what the sale yielded me, I too should have been among the wrecks of that terrific visitation. Well, I'll tell you what, I sold mine and then uh, COVID came and everything got shut down and uh, my successor, anyway, I could have written this. <laughs> I could have written mm -hmm. this. Yeah, so he and his wife go out on these trips out into the countryside and spend a lot of time, a lot of time trying to figure out where they want to be and what they want to buy is really great. He said, uh, I, and this is about his wife again. I had long since made up my mind from observation of the good or bad luck of other men that he who happens to be blessed with a wife possessing good sense and good judgment succeeds or fails in life according to uh, how he is accustomed to consult her in his business enterprises. There's a world of caution, shrewdness, and latent wisdom in such women, which their husbands too frequently disregard to their ruin. Um, so yeah, he took her along on all these trips and, uh, and they ultimately found the the title of the book is 10 acres enough. I think they actually bought 11, didn't they? Yeah, I think so. I think it was 11. He cut a fat hog. He got a great, he got 11 acres with a good house on it that the wife loved and a nice garden. And, um, uh, was very, very happy. He said, my family received as safe a shelter for the interest of a thousand dollars as he had given them for the interest of 5,000. The feeling of relief from this unappeasable demand was indescribable. 
Curiously enough, my wife voluntarily suggested that the same feeling of relief had been presented to her. But in addition to this huge equivalent for the investment of $1,000, there was that which might be hereafter realized from the cultivation of the 11 acres of land. They were out of debt, had a roof, and had everything in front of them. One of our friends, Carl, came and visited us not too long ago, and he had over $200,000 worth of student loan debt. Mm -hmm. PhD, PhD student. He wasn't all student loan. He also had a small business and, and was an all student loan. And I'd been harping at him for a long time. And another friend of ours, Kirkham, had been yelling at him about paying that debt off. And he, he makes a high income. He does really well. And he, he tackled this in earnest this year and he's paid off, well, a great deal of it. And he said when, when, when that number went from six to five digits, he said he felt lighter. He hasn't even paid it off yet in life's different. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a security in it. I mean, having to, having other people own your stuff is, that's yep. rough. So, so he bought this land and then he's got to do something with it. He wants to plan it and he's already come up with this idea of, doing the, what's essentially companion planting or high density planting of small fruits, peaches, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries. The blackberries are kind of an afterthought, but it all ends up working for him. And you'll hear about it here in a bit. He paid $600 for the house in the 11 acres. Right away. He paid $200 for some manure. That's expensive. Holy, holy shit. <laughs> that is a lot of money. And on and over and over and over again, he says he wishes he had bought more or wishes he could have bought more. Uh, he planted 804 peach trees for seven cents a piece for a total of $56.28. He says, uh, the season turned out to be abundantly showery. And they went on growing from the start. Not a tree was upset by storm or wind, nor did one of them die. Well, I planted 79 fruit trees in February, and I lost nine. Well, it's not New Jersey. He planted 804. Do we believe him? Yeah, I believe I him. I do. I do, too. I like what I he said. Him. What is it? The last paragraph of chapter 5. He says, when all our household fixings had been snugly arranged, I took my first walk over my little plantation on a soft and balmy morning. My feeling of contentment seemed to be perfect. I knew that I was not rich, but it was certain that I was not poor. Yep. I like that. With all his wealth, Rothschild, who's that? Must be satisfied with the same sky that was spread over me. There's some good tidbits in here. Yeah. He can write, man. The millionaire could not have had more than his share of the pure atmosphere that I was breathing, while the poorest of all men could have as much. It's great. So he plants these peach trees on 18-foot centers. And then in the rows between, between those, betwixt them, he plants raspberries. And then he's got 18-foot aisles. And then he sowed or planted strawberries in the aisles. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. No bare soil. No bare soil. I was just reading about green manures. It's a thing I, I didn't know what it was. But like uh, underseeding your corn with alfalfa or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have the manure, the brown manure, which comes out of the rear end of a of a critter. And the green manure, which is stuff that you plant that you're preparing the way for the next crop that you're going to put in that spot. Uh, yeah, it's either that or the weeds. It's better than letting the weeds grow. Put something yeah. there that will crowd the weeds out and uh, uh, give some value to the, to the soil. Because, well, I think he knows this. He doesn't say it this way. You're not growing raspberries. You're tending the soil. Yeah. That's your first job. The soil has to be good. And then the raspberries will grow. The guy's work ethic 
is astounding. Uh, this is chapter seven. He says, immediately on getting my raspberries in, I went twice over the six acres with the cultivator, starting up the ground some four inches deep, as it had been a good deal trampled by our planting operations. This I did myself with a $30 horse, which I'd recently bought. Okay, that's some work. I get it. It's fine. Having 18 feet between the rows, uh, between two rows of peach trees, I divided this space into five rows for strawberries. Strawberries. That's what they say over the pond. Strawberries giving me very nearly three feet between each row. In these rows, I set the strawberry plants one foot apart, making about 10,000 plants per acre, allowing for the headlands. I bought the whole 60,000 plants required for $2 per thousand, making us $120. In planting these, I got three of the children to help me, and though it was more tiresome work than they had ever been accustomed to, they stood up bravely to it. Every noon we went, we four went home with raging appetites for dinner. Because, you know, the midday meal is dinner. The evening meal is supper. Yes. That's what correct, proper people say. Uh, where the plain but well-cooked fare provided by my wife and eldest daughter, for she kept no surgeon, servant, was devoured with genuine country relish. Um, the exercise in the open air for the whole week which it took us to get through this job did us all a vast amount of good. Roses came into the cheeks of my daughters, to which the cheeks aforesaid had been strangers in the city, and it was the general remark among us at breakfast that it had never felt so good to get to bed the night before. Did you catch what he snuck in there? They planted 60,000 plants in one week. Five people, most of which are probably children under 12. That's a lot of work. I'm going to say they worked five, six days a week. That's 10,000 a day. That's 2,000 a person. If it's 12, Hour days, that's 166 plants an hour per person. No wonder they what? suck well. Thus, honest labor brought wholesome appetites and sound repose. But they were a little stiff, he says. <laughs> more, more stooping helps that, he says. <laughs> oh, it- and it, it's funny how he writes this. It's no big deal. I have some jobs ahead of me. I got to put some stuff in. And, uh, and I'm thinking, to me, it's a huge deal. But you know what? I mean, I probably got to, I got to put a fence in. I absolutely have to put a fence in. And the thought of it is more daunting probably than the actuality of it's going to be. Yeah. You know, once you get started on this kind of work, physical work. The cool thing about physical work, as opposed to uh, other sorts of work that that's mental, physical work doesn't require mind. Doesn't require very much. I mean, once you figure it out, you know what I mean? I'm not saying it's, it's mindless, yeah. but I'm saying I'm going to run the fence this way. So I got to put this many fence poles in. So I have to cart them over and I got to pound them in and I got to run the wire through it. And But once you get into it, it's it, believe it or not, is actually relaxing, except that your body gets tired. Yes, and the body does adapt to the work. Yeah. If you're a knowledge worker, you never adapt to the stress and the strains of that. There's no stress recovery adaptation for being shrieked at about cold calling volume. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Carl. Yes. My whole body has stress recovery adaptation. I have no fast twitch muscle fiber anymore. It's all gone. I'm sorry. And I only had two. <laughs> Both of them died. Yep. Where were they? Were they in the quadricep? <laughs> Pro- n- n- uh, yeah, probably. Probably. But you can adapt to it. And uh, uh, honestly, you get done and you can look back. You can look back at the row that you did. Say, well, that's what I accomplished. Something concrete that I accomplished, which, you know, you get in your cubicle, you look at the end of the day. Well, what did I do? I was on the phone a lot. I was in meetings a lot. You know, that was one of my problems. I, when I taught, when I taught in college, the, I, I do think it got worse. I think over the 20 years it got worse. But you'd get done even with a semester and you, you'd been talking at these people for 
five months. Like, what did they get out of it? I don't know. Maybe one or two of them show some evidence that something was gotten from it, but you'd just be, be sad. It's like, that's why I like coaching better than that. Coaching, give me 20 minutes. I can get you to squat. At least I, I something I mean, that's pretty concrete. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. I can see the attraction. Ugh. How old was he when he started doing this? I think he was 40 or 41. Chapter, we got kind of got to kind of move on here. Chapter nine, he talks about the market garden his wife and the and the eldest daughter were operating. They kept a book account of these consignments. So uh when they would go to town, they would take produce. They had the market garden, which was a nice size garden, it had asparagus and all the other vegetables you would, you would expect. And there were ten mature peach trees in that garden when they bought the place. The eight hundred some that he planted, well, those aren't going to be able to bear fruit for many years, but they're getting a crop off of the tin uh, immediately. And it's not a great crop because those had been uh, mismanaged and needed attention, which they gave right away. But Kate and the wife, Kate, the oldest daughter, and the wife go to town and bring produce and uh, buy their supplies, whatever they need. I took my wife's advice and from time to time gathered such as she directed, which are these vegetables and things. He would go pick the garden for her. And she and Kate were sole mistresses of the garden and sent them to the store. They kept a regular book account for these consignments. And when we came to settle up with the storekeeper at the year's end, we're surprised to find that he had $80 to our credit. Wendell Berry talks about this and Jaber Crow about how the women would go to town for groceries and come home with money. Mm-hmm. They'd bring four dozen eggs. I don't know how you would do that now. Uh, you you can't go to the Jewel. Jewel's our big grocery store. You can't go there with a pile of, of cucumbers and say, I got cucumbers to sell. There are, you know, you'll have to read Joel Salatin about it or others. There are, there are places that will buy organic produce and, uh, you know, of course, you could do if market day is farmers market on Saturday. Perhaps you go to the farmers market and on Saturday and sell your stuff. You, you know, it's not a maybe. Maybe you wouldn't have accounts with the grocer in town, but maybe you go on Saturday only and you s- sell stuff, and then you go over to uh, Harps is the, is the grocery store nearest you. I think you know maybe you get to come home with more m- money than you left with. But Wendell Berry talked about that was still happening in the '30s and even in the '40s. Mm -hmm. By the way, listen to this. He goes on in that next paragraph. He says, it was a new feature in her experience. Everything seemed to sell. Whenever she needed a new dress for herself or any of the children, all she had to do was go to the store and get it and have it charged against her garden fund. They're clothing and shoeing the kids out of this and still came home with 80 bucks at the end of the year. Sounds pretty good. I want to read uh, just a, a bit of the poetry from right at the end of chapter eight. The fragrance of a fat and ample manure heap is as grateful to the nostrils of a good farmer as the fumes of the tavern are notoriously attractive to those of a poor one. <laughs> the poor farmer. Yep. The poor farmer. He's going to the bar. At the ta- <laughs> Instead of tending to his manure. Yeah. Boy, I tell you, Edmund Morris has shamed me. Uh, In what way? I do not hoe and cultivate and weed my place as diligently as he does. No, I was thinking about that. I bought a cheap hoe. It's not yeah, dirty. It's, just it's a, not a cheap, just dirty a cheap hoe, one. but I, I got It'll one. It'll be dirty, Sam. Yeah, I sharpened it. But I, you know, the way he talks about going after the weeds, I think they probably did it every day. He hired a guy. Yeah, you have to. Dick, to just... Oh, I'm not going to have as many acres, I think, under as he is, but starting a garden. Uh, but he thinks it's better than watering. I thought that was interesting. I wonder if that's true. I think maybe once you have enough water, <laughs> it's better than more maybe watering. Maybe in New Jersey it's yeah, true. It's too damn dry here to say that. Yeah. He says, I spent $5 in buying for them. This is his wife and Kate a complete outfit of hoses, rakes, hose, rakes, and trowels for garden use, lightly made on purpose for female handling with a neat little wheelbarrow, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, I've got a big old cotton hoe. It's just too big for the kids or the wife to use. The handle's too big around. It's too heavy. And I'm like, man, if I, I would really like to find some light, well-made garden tools. Not children's, but just lightweight, well-made ones. They're lightweight, junky ones. Yeah, I'd like to find some of those. Those opportunities for people. It is. He says that they, you know, they would just, you know, attack the weeds. And, uh, and he, he does, he says that, uh, that if you take, uh, some cabbage plants and carefully hoe and cultivate them and then just water another group that the, that the ones that are, uh, cultivated more do better than the ones that are watered more. I don't know. I bet he was right. Well, but he thinks it's because of the dew. He thinks that having the rough surface causes the dew to, uh, settle on the dirt more. There's more surface yeah. area. Well, Soil, if you remember from our Holistic Resource Management book by Alan Savory, he talks about the soil will cap. You know, if it's a clay-like soil, it will oh, get yeah. a, a crust on top of it. Then when it rains, the the, the, sub, the soil below the cap doesn't take it up. So he's, he's into breaking that cap. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we used to go out, you go out in construction sites. And when I was a young man, I was a rod man on a, a survey crew. The grunt. I... I swung the sledgehammer and uh, carried everything. And you'd go out after it rained, you know, and a few hours after it rained, it'd be dry again. Yeah. Because the, the water just ran, just ran right off that clay. Ugh. It's no good. The cow, the saint of the barnyard, Carl. They had two cows that they first bought. The first one... That wouldn't give milk. I forget. What was the problem with the first cow? Well, she had never been milked, and they bought her with a calf. And having never been milked and the calf being there and them being green, you know, inexperienced milkers, they they couldn't milk her. And they brought in the neighbor lady who was was experienced with such things, an experienced milkmaid. And uh, I think everybody got kicked <laughs> and every bucket got knocked over. They ended up selling that one and then... Uh, we're able to buy a reliable, proven uh, milk cow from down the road. Yeah. What do you think his neighbors thought of him? Oh, listen, I know what mine think of me. <laughs> they thought he was, well, he says they thought he was crazy. He said they would come and lean on the fence while he and, was it Dan, the hired help, Bob? Dick. 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 Whatever, one of those names. We're out there, you know, trying to fight these weeds, and the neighbors would come and lean on the fence and tell him, you ain't going to win, <laughs> you know. Uh, so they they thought he was they thought he was crazy. Can I I want to read a little bit of of, of prime racism here, mm. which of which I was with which I was offended. This about Germans, since me sainted grandmother is from Ireland. No. This is in chapter ten, about I don't know five paragraphs in, uh, talking about milkmaids. Now most women profess to understand precisely how a cow should be milked, and yet comparatively few know anything about it. They remind me of the Irish girls who are hunting places. These are all first-rate cooks, if you take their word for it, and yet not one in a hundred does anything of even the first principles of cooking. Hmm. Must have been this plague of Irish girls around <laughs> Philadelphia. Trying to get married. Well, trying to get a just a job. Oh, I see. Oh, sure, I can cook. Right. My sister tells a story about, she'll be mad at me, I'm telling this story. This lady I know... Tells me a story about going to a job interview in like 95 or 6 or something like that. And they're like, do you take dictation? I'm like, sure. And they said, all right, excellent. See you Monday. You start Monday. And she showed up. And he's like, all right, uh, get your stenographer's pad. Uh, take this letter down. You know, and he paced back and forth in the office, you know. Dear Mr. Jenkins. And then Dick say, dictates this letter. And he says, okay, read it back to me. And she's like, ah, I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Did she get fired? Oh yeah. <laughs> I got nothing, man. Sorry. <laughs> you get the job, then you go study hard, and figure out how to do it. Unless it's dictation or cooking. Like they're like, all right, cook a meal. Yahtzee. <laughs> go. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I got nothing. Uh yeah, so he and Dick. Um, decided, well, not Dick, Mr. Morris decided 
that there was a seed bank there in the soil. There were weed seeds in the soil. And that if they just cultivated and put to death all the new weeds, it would reduce the number of seeds in the soil. And that those next, that crop of seeds would, that was still there, some of them would come up and then they would destroy them. And then by and by, there aren't going to be any seeds left. He's going to destroy the natural seed bank mm -hmm. through diligent cultivation. And Dick just ain't buying it. He's happy to take the pay, though. Oh, he says, I'll admit that my man Dick was quite as certain as my neighbors that we could never get permanently ahead of the weeds and that thus lacking faith, he took hold of the cultivator and weeder while I attacked the enemy in the rows and by places. Uh, he did it. I mean, cheerfully, apparently, and diligently, Dick worked, but he he <laughs> he wasn't sure about that. You know, I'm th this could be a, a TV show. With Ruth Goodman? It's Green Acres. Oh, okay. With Ava Gabor. The way it's told, it's kind of entertaining, the, the, the misadventures that he has. And uh, it'd be the sort of movie that would have been made in 1939. Right. Ten Acres Enough. Ten Acres Enough. Jimmy Stewart. With, with a young Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. I watched that. Elizabeth Taylor as Kate. <laughs> no, Kate's not spoiled. Several neighboring farmers who had doubtless counted on this state of things came along about the time they supposed my hands would be full, looked over the fence at my courageous onslaught, laughed and called out, it's no use, you can't kill the weeds. Such was the sympathy they afforded me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, two or three years into it, he's starting to win. You know, and this is organic farming. He doesn't have any Roundup. He doesn't have any broadleaf killer. He doesn't have plastic mulch. He doesn't have tar silage tarps. Hell, he doesn't. He barely has mulches. I mean, he's made it. He, he, I don't remember him saying anything about this explicitly, but anything that he could have used for a mulch, he composts. He he's choosing manure over compost. Or I'm sorry, over a mulch or a ground cover. Yeah. No use you can't kill the weeds is a little bit after that. Such is the sympathy they afforded. If my house had been on fire, every one of them would have promptly hurried to the rescue. <laughs> but to assist a man in killing his weeds what was what no one dreamed of doing. He didn't kill his own. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, Dick utterly denied the premises. He had no faith in our Jersey weeds ever being killed. He does it. You know, oh, this could be a good Hallmark movie. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm still thinking movies. The weeds kill me. We put it in a garden, you know, his first year on this plot. And the weed pressure is just astounding. I, I, I couldn't, I mean, I didn't have six acres of it like him. I couldn't hardly stay ahead of it. Man, it's serious. If you've ever done any garden hoeing and cultivating, You'll know this. This is these guys worked super, super hard to do this. That's why I was talking about him just shame, he was just shaming me. You know, he's got six <laughs> acres of it, and then later on, he plants an acre of tomatoes, and then several acres of blackberries. He he essentially ends up having. I didn't ever write it down and do the math. He probably has eight or nine of the eleven acres under cultivation, and. He, with fruit. With fruit. Yeah. And and he tells the story of it, and it sounds like the tidiest, neatest farm you ever did see. I can't imagine. Be a lot of work. How many acres do you have under cultivation in your garden? 20th? What, uh, acres 54,000 square feet? Uh, a tenth? You need to get those hoes. Right. You got 43,560 square feet in an acre. So I'm a little I'm a little more than a tenth, Carl. <laughs> yeah, just get get the hose, put them by the door every every time people go out. They got to take it. I've got um, around eighty trees. I I went and I cultivated around all them and remulched them and you know made them ready for the winter essentially, and that that took me two full days. Just just tending the trees, no, you know, it's fine. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. It you know whatever, but that garden. Ugh, screw that. Maybe it'll go better this year. No, it's going to. Well, don't plant too early this time. I didn't plant too early last time. 
But you had the late freeze. I had the late freeze. What are you going to do? When did you plant? I planted, well, I didn't plant everything at the same time, but uh, we, we had two nights of hard freeze in Oklahoma on April 20th. We had snow April 20th and the 21st. We had snow the night of the 20th. I think I was out there that the week before. That's unheard of. We didn't have everything in, but we had, we had some stuff in, you know, we, you plant potatoes and in, in Oklahoma in, in USDA zone seven, a you'll plant some uh, potatoes maybe at the end of March, the potatoes had already come up, killed mm-hmm. all of that. The fruit trees are planted in February, which is appropriate. They had leafed out, killed all of them back. If you are a subsistence farmer and you have the luxury, you should plant, I'm going to say two or three gardens. Uh, you need to plant one in well-drained soil, one in the soil that doesn't drain as well. You need to plant some early, some late, blah, blah, blah. You got to hedge your bets. You know, it was mm-hmm. so blast. It was so wet this entire year, actually, up until about June 15th, that damn near everything I planted drowned, that everything I had froze didn't freeze drowned. Now, next time, if you plant on the higher, well, more well-drained land, Maybe a drought year and it all dies. I mean, you, you got to, I mean, if, if it matters, you got to do everything. And then you're going to have years yeah. where you hear the bumper crop. You're going to have years where like most of the stuff you do works. And then you feed all the fruit and the vegetables to the hogs because <laughs> you can't deal with them all. <laughs> yeah. Be nice to have the problem of abundance. He says, he's poking right at me, Carl. He's screwing with me. He says uh, he had cultivated, and this weed purslane had come up instead of his turnips. He said it almost staggered me as to the correctness of my theory that the number of seeds in the ground yet to vegetate must somewhere have a limit. Here were evidently a million of kinds which up to this time had not even showed themselves. So this is a weed he had never even seen before on the place. And he says, uh, we then recultivated the ground and sowed it again with turnips, but the yield was very poor. Either the purslane had appropriated the whole energy of the guano, or the sowing was too late in the season. But this little incident will illustrate the value of observation to a farmer. This is where he pokes me in the eye. Book farming is a good thing in its place, but observation is more instructive. Book farming. Mm-hmm. Here I am. Here I am reading his book about farming. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what he had done. He'd been living in the city, reading all the farming books, figuring he knew what to do. Yeah. They did pretty well. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, he crushes it. Yeah.